well as listen, you can do so on Global Player on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk or the LBC Facebook and YouTube feeds. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock. The Queen has pulled out of hosting a major reception for world leaders at the COP26 climate change summit in Glasgow. Buckingham Palace says she's been told by doctors to rest after an overnight stay in hospital last Wednesday. Her Majesty will now record a video speech for delegates later this week instead. A Conservative MP is facing a 30-day suspension from Parliament over claims he broke the rules over commercial lobbying. Former Minister Owen Powell Patterson is accused of repeatedly using his position to benefit two companies who paid him as a consultant. He's told LBC he wants to take the Common Standards Committee to court for a judicial review. And my lawyers are absolutely convinced that I'd win within minutes. They said this would not stand any scrutiny under any normal court system. The UN is warning current ambitions to cut carbon emissions still fall short of curbing dangerous global warming. A report says despite updated global targets, the world's facing rising temperatures of 2.7 degrees Celsius by 2100. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up 54 points at 72.77. The pound buys $1.37 and €1.18. LBC weather outbreaks of heavy rain moving southwards across Scotland, Northern Ireland and northern England overnight. Mild for many with a low of 14 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Lucinda Horsley. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. It's Tuesday's edition of Cross Question. Our panel are here in the studio. You can ask your questions on 0345 6060 973. You can watch us on Global Player on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk or indeed the LBC YouTube and Facebook channels. With me are David Laws, the former Lib Dem Cabinet Minister, Nikki Aiken, the Conservative MP for the cities of London and Westminster, our very own Denise Headley, and also Ben Riley Smith, the political editor of the Daily Telegraph. Lots of questions coming in, but we can always do with more. 0345 6060 973. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Right, let's crack on with the first question. Welcome to you all. It's from Alexander in Liverpool. Alexander, what's your question, please? Oh, hello. Um, may, may I ask each individual member of the panel, what are they doing personally to help the climate crisis? Um, well, I can answer that. I'm not going to COP26. I think that that's my contribution. Uh, ben Riley smith You know, I have actually started to eat a little less meat. Uh, partly it's a healthy thing as well. You're told, you know, sausages and everything are packed with fats. But you do hear so much of the carbon emissions of the world. I mean, a staggering amount come from livestock and uh, turning livestock into um, packaged meat. So I have started to do a bit of that. I don't drive, so I don't have an electric car or a diesel car. Um, obviously, try to do recycling. You know, the other thing I realised uh, for a story, uh, the number of coffee cups we throw away. Mm. I think the, the latest estimate was 8 million a day in the UK. Uh, close to three billion a year, so I am getting back to using my um, recyclable coffee cup as well. That's another thing I don't do: drink coffee. So I, I'm feeling very virtuous today, Denise. Um, I think one of the key things that I do is also I have reduced my meat consumption. I try to have um, vegetables or have a vegetable-based dish at least four days a week, and then I eat meat maybe on a Sunday. I eat double portions, obviously. No, of course not. <laughs> What are you trying to say? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it's okay. We're old friends. It's all right. <laughs> no, but I mean, um, I also, I have a bike. So I use my bike a lot more than as opposed to drive. I use public transport more. I do all of my recycling, wet recycling and dry recyclables. So I think I'm trying my best to reduce my carbon footprint in that way. You win so far. Nikki? <laughs> well, all of the above. Um, I think also... Um, I'm trying not to 
buy anything as much as I used to like clothes I'm trying to uh just get by with what I've got and I've, I've got quite a lot of clothes in my in my wardrobe so you know I'm not going to go uh soft on it but I think that's what we've got to do we've got to really watch our consumption on goods um and I'm also trying to teach my children that as well because obviously I've got teenagers and Good they love their time. fashion so trying to teach them about that so I think you know we've all got our part to play Every little, every little bit counts. I was reading an article the other day that was saying it doesn't really matter what we all do as individuals. It, it's the, it's what governments do that counts. Do you think, David Laws, there's a, there's a bit of self-congratulation here where we all think we're doing something for the environment, but actually we're making very little difference? Well, I hope it's a bit more than that, but I certainly think that without government policy leaning in the right direction and reinforcing the incentives, it's a, it's it's a bit naive and hopeful to think that individual decisions will determine all of this. And then there's the question of how much some of the the better activity recently that is helping on climate change will survive the end of the pandemic. I mean, I think that I've travelled considerably less during the pandemic. I work from home more. I tend to walk more when I can, partly, uh, you know, to be in a sort of COVID-free environment. And the question is, can we sustain some of these things beyond the period of the pandemic, which I think we're going to need to do if we're going to reduce carbon emissions in on a scale that is necessary in order to meet the sort of targets that are being debated over the next couple of weeks. Um, let's just on the back of that, just ask you all what you think the definition for success for COP26 would be, or, or indeed failure. Let's start with you, David. I think firstly, significantly increasing the pledges uh, that are being made by uh, the collective nations that are meeting as part of this conference. We know that the combined pledges that are, are being made to date are not nearly enough to reduce carbon emissions by the extent to which is necessary to stop temperatures rising very rapidly. Uh, and it may be that some of the countries at this particular conference are not going to be willing to, to amend their policies, but if they come under sufficient pressure that causes them to go back home and start to rethink some of the individual commitments that they're making, then that would amount to progress. Because at the moment, we do not appear to be on course to halt the increase in global warming that we're likely to see over the course of this century. Nikki? Well, I think the West is... The Western countries are doing uh, as much as they can so far with, with trying to bring agreement together. But I think if we don't have China, India, Brazil at the table and agreeing, then, you know, we've got problems. Well, they are going to be at the table because well, they're leaders. The leaders are not. And I think that's a, that's a message that concerns me, that if the, if the leaders aren't there, um, and you can have envoys, and I'm sure the people attending are very senior, but I think this is such a climate emergency, this is a global issue, that, yes, collectives of countries can work together, and that's really important, and I think Europe is obviously leading the way but if the three largest countries for emissions in the in the world are not going to be the leaders are not going to be at the table then i am concerned is that a failure on the part of alex sharma or boris johnson no, to get them to come no i don't think it's a failure i think it's it i think it speaks volumes about what those countries are really thinking about climate change and they are the ones we've got to get on board and that's what you know that's what always frustrates me when we see the likes of XR and Insulate Britain and their actions in this country where this is probably the greenest co government we've ever had and we are working very hard to, to, to reach our targets they should be really <laughs> aiming okay. their frustrations at the likes of China, India and Brazil and perhaps Russia Denise um, I don't accept the point that Insulate Britain should be directing their concerns at other countries. I think we in this country have not actually you know, done all that we can to reach our own climate commitments. But I think one of the key um, failures of COP at the moment is the absence of women and women's and girls' issues vis-a-vis -vis climate change being centred at the at the centre of COP. Because there was a, the Global Women's Assembly for Climate Justice, which was a side issue that was done by the UN. They talked about how important it was that women and girls were centred at the centre of climate change because they experience it the worst by land displacement, by not being able to do the roles that they can do when climate problems arise such as flooding uh, increases in heat so for me uh, an area of success 
would not to have a be would be not to have a one day event for women and gender issues at COP. It would be for COP to have women, girls, and indigenous communities at the center of every policy. So as far as I'm concerned, I don't think there's going to be huge amounts of headway. Ben. Well, that's the question we've been asking government is what does success look like? Uh, I think the truth is it's fiendishly difficult to answer that question. As I understand that COP26 is not trying to come up with huge, massive new targets or agreements. It's about how you deliver the ones you've previously done. But I would offer two up two things for listeners to watch out for. One is Boris keeps on talking about keep 1.5 alive. You've got to be able to say that uh, global warming can somehow be kept at 1.5 degrees and not 2 degrees and higher. Uh, look to environmental charities to see whether that has... We've taken a step towards that at COP26. And then these four things the Prime Minister keeps talking about, cars, cash, coal and trees. Uh, is there real proof that we are heading towards and hitting the targets that have been made there? OK, well, I suspect that's going to be a subject that we talk a lot about on the programme over the next uh, couple of weeks or so. Uh, Alexander, thank you for your question. Let's go to Alex in Watford. Alex, hi, what's your question, please? Uh, good evening, in and the in interesting panel we've got tonight. Um, we've had the good news regarding the budget. The budget. What's the bad news going to be in tomorrow's budget, please? Because <laughs> what, what the one hand giveth, the other taketh away normally in budgets. Um... Uh, ben, let's come to you first on this, because you probably have a little bit more insight into what m we might be hearing tomorrow than the rest of us. Well, we've been watching it very closely. I think what we've seen, uh, as your listener was saying, was the good news. All the spending perks and packages that they've been agreed in this big spending review that will see the Treasury determine the spending for each government department for three years. I think one of the big questions is, will there be cuts at some of those unprotected departments? And if so... How deep will those cuts go? Now, even when you say the word cuts, the Treasury gets very nervous and says, oh, if there are any reductions in budget, then it's savings and efficiencies. And they are absolutely steadfast in saying you will not see a return to austerity, that period under David Cameron when there were public spending cuts after the financial crash. But I think the details of each government department spending and how that compared to last year is where some of the pain might come. Because it's quite difficult, David Laws, and you, you were Chief Secretary of the Treasury, it's quite difficult to see which government departments have a lot of fat on them at the moment after 11 years of efficiency savings and cuts. That's absolutely right. I mean, over that period of time, the fact that there was in some areas at the end of uh, the period of Labour government, where you've seen a very big expansion of public spending, most of that has been driven out and probably some muscle as well. So the Chancellor, in trying to find more money for things like the NHS, uh, without increasing the public spending envelope too much, uh, has got to see if he can find some efficiency savings in areas that are less sensitive. And he also confronts some difficult challenges in areas like uh, education, where you know there have been big learning losses during the pandemic there is a real risk that many young people particularly in more disadvantaged areas and in the north of the midlands won't catch up yet it seems as if uh, so far the government has not allocated the sorts of amounts of money we've seen in some other countries for education recovery so i think it'd be very interesting to see whether there's anything that hasn't been pre-announced that that emerges in the in the budget on that tomorrow um and of course I think you know, my final point is that this year has been a sort of big rebound year for the economy uh, and inflation on the whole has been relatively low. So it's been a, a, an easier year for the Chancellor to na navigate through than clearly 2020 was, which is a very challenging year. I suspect that 2022 is going to be a bit tougher. We're going to have inflation higher and we're going to have growth probably lower. So I think it's going to be a less benign environment for the Chancellor steering economic policy through the 12 months ahead. Now, Nicky, you're clearly going to say that everything the Chancellor announces is going to be fabulous. Um, but what, what don't you want him to do? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't want to put, put up many taxes, if that's uh, possible. Um, I think a lot of it is about reform. And what I want to see is more reform, Ian. Reform of business rates, reform of uh, local government financing. Uh, it's not always about money. It's always, it's, I find it's always about the way you can reconfigure services. So when I was uh, a councillor, I saw my uh, budget cut by 50%, which meant I had to start with a blank sheet and 
restructure my services, which actually meant... Because we should say you used to be leader of Westminster Council. Yeah, and I was cabinet member for children and, and public protection. And one of the things we did was we reformed. So when I was uh, responsible for children's services, we went into a tri-borough scheme system with Kenton and Chelsea and Hammersmith. We then turned our children's services into an outstanding Ofsted rated children's services team. It doesn't always have to be about money. We have to be able to reform as well. And that's what I want to see more of. If it is about money, if, as the Chancellor says today, that public sector pay is going to increase next year, I mean, that money's got to come from somewhere, hasn't it? It's either borrowing or extra taxes. You say you don't want extra taxes. So are you prepared for more borrowing? Well, let's let's see what the Chancellor has to say tomorrow, tomorrow at 12.30, shall we, before we start second-guessing him. But I do think that uh, we've got to rebuild the economy, as we know from the COVID. I had meetings this this morning with central London businesses who, you know, they are not back to normal, nowhere near back to normal. And uh, we've got to see international visitors back. We've got to see uh, an end to home working. We've got to see people back into uh, central London to rebuild the economy because we know that central London is the is the engine of the UK economy. OK, Denise. Um, what other bad news items coming out of the budget? I think there isn't enough support for working families. I mean, with the reduction of the £20 universal uplift, I think that there should have been more support for people who are going to face a huge cost of living increase because we know what's coming down the line in terms of increasing um, in, what, the increase in potentially council tax that's going to hit people. Also, the fact that people have to pay more national insurance contributions. So I think any gains that people earned during... Um, with the with the um, increase in the minimum wage for those people, I don't think it's going to translate into tangible gains because so much money you're going to have to pay for your rent and all your other costs. So, working families to me have missed out. I mean, I know there was a there's I think it's a 500 million pound for almost like a revitalised Shore Start scheme, but that's still not sufficient to help what I think working families need, as well as all that prenatal care. I don't think there's enough money there at all. There could okay. be more. Well, Wednesday's edition of Cross Question will be a budget special. We have four economic experts joining us, so we'll be wanting to hear your questions on the budget tomorrow night between 8 and 9. Uh, Alex, thank you for your question. We'll have more in a moment. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. You're listening to LBC's Cross Question, or maybe even watching it. It's 17 minutes past 8. This is LBC. We're
Boss Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.20 on LBC. I just had that awful moment where my producer put on my screen, your shirt is buttoned up weirdly. That's because I <laughs> I had my booster jab this afternoon and clearly didn't do it up That's properly. Your excuse. And thank you to the lovely lady who administered the jab, who also thanked us for all of the stuff we did on British Airways. She was from British Airways cabin crew. You may remember last year, um, we exposed a lot of the British Airways shenanigans over that. Uh, at least said about that, the better in some ways. Right, let's go to our next question. We have David Law. Denise Headley, Nikki Aiken, and Ben Riley Smith with us answering your calls. Ben's in Clacton. Hello, Ben. Hello, Ian. The Hi. question is um, the privatisation of the, the water companies, uh, uh, given the latest release of sewage into the environment, has the privatisations generally been a success? Well, let's stick on water privatisation uh, there. Nikki Aiken. Um, I'm not sure what. Uh, ben, you're referring to the m more sewage being uh, flowing into our seas. What, what, so what's, what's that based on? Information on the news that I've been watching for the last two days uh, and also information from uh, looked up off what's where they find companies uh, last year. And to, we, they started off in 2019 and they find uh, lots of water companies for release of sewage. Uh, and also of uh, billing and all sorts of other things. And it seems yeah. to me that the, the consumer of uh, uh, private industries that are running uh, previously uh, services provided by government is just a, a, an excuse to print money. Well, I think the fact that these water companies are being fined and they're being fined heavily shows that they are being held to account for their actions. And I think the plans that the government has got within the environmental, the environment bill um, is to uh, increase the uh, ability of off what to get even tougher on the water companies. I personally do not believe that uh, renationalising them would improve things. Uh, I think if we go back. 30, 40 years to when utilities were run by governments. They were not run well. I was reminiscing this morning about when my nan used to have to had to go around to my aunties to phone my dad uh, every Sunday because it, she was waiting and she was waiting for three years for the then government-owned uh, British Telecom to put a phone in to her house. So I think we've got to remember and let's not forget how British Rail was in the uh, 70s and 80s, because I remember that well, and they were not pleasant trains. They very, very rarely ran on time. So I'm not saying that the companies that have taken over are perfect, but they are properly regulated, and I think they are better than they were 40 years ago. Isn't the point here that the government has done yet another U-turn? Because uh, you will vote through, through the voting lobbies last week to vote, as far as I can recall, and Ben can correct me on this if I'm wrong, there was an, an amendment put down uh, to amend a piece of legislation which would have allowed more sewage to be pumped into the seas. And you all, you all supported that. Um, and now the government is saying, no, we're going to put down our own amendment to the legislation, which will reverse that. I mean, it's a panic reaction, isn't it? Well, I think that at least the government, I think you can say the government has actually listened. And from uh, my mailbag, I know that people were concerned. And hopefully now we will have a compromise and that we will have a, an amendment and a, and a bill that becomes an act that will clean up our rivers and our sea more than it than, than, than it has been before. But it, it's a bit rich if, if it's a government saying, well, we're the greenest government ever, uh, which you actually just said a few, a few moments ago. I think ago, we are, though, Ian. And then you all troop through the voting lobbies to support sewage being pumped into the sea. I mean, there's a word for that. It begins with an H. Hypocrisy. But, yeah, I was trying to figure out what it was. Yeah, I got that, yeah. Look, I think at least the government has listened and if there, it is accepting uh, this this newer, uh, this newer new amendment, then I think I haven't got a problem with that. I okay. think it's about... If, 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 if the government was ignoring concerns, then there would, that would be different. David? Yeah, I think the row has done us a huge service in informing us about how many sewage discharges into rivers and our seas there still are after a period of decades when actually many people thought that there had been a lot of investment going in and there has been 
I think, genuinely some progress in reducing sewage discharge, discharges, particularly into the oceans uh, around these islands. And that was actually one reason for water privatisation, wasn't it? Because that you weren't getting the investment needed to purify the... I, I don't know what the technical yeah. term is, but purify the, the water that needs to be purified. And that's my second point. I mean, I think that this story shows us that we've got a long way to go. But whether the questioner is right to suggest that we would have had fewer of these problems if the government had been controlling investment, I seriously doubt that as soon as uh, you're competing for investment in the utilities and going to government saying we need this investment to clean up our shores, you're competing against hospital buildings, school building, roads, a lot of popular things. Or you're asking the government to sanction big increases in the prices of water, of energy, of rail, of post. And the government never finds a nice, you know, there's never a nice political moment mm. to increase utility prices. So the temptation is to cap those things and the consequences under investment. And in a way, although it's very difficult to sell this to the public, one of the benefits of privatisation of some of these utilities has been to allow more rapid increases in prices than would otherwise have occurred and more investment. And that's not an easy message to give to consumers, but I think... Particularly if you're a Liberal Democrat, because you're sounding very right-wing on this one, if I may say so. I think it's... I mean, (laughs) one of the things we did during the coalition, which hadn't been done for many years, was to privatise the Royal Mail. Yes. Um, Done by Liberal Democrat ministers. Absolutely. I think the Royal Mail is far better off in the private sector, uh, where it can select its own investment priorities, where it has more... Freedom, frankly, in postage prices, which have gone up a lot, not popular, but now it can invest in some of the things that governments were not willing to sign off when it was government responsible for postage prices, when it was Mm. government that had to determine the investment. Denise. The question is, has the privatisation of the water sub companies been a success? And I don't, I think that depends on very much who you speak to, because I think the cop, the, the, um, essential services being privatised doesn't necessarily benefit the customers in the way that you think it would benefit the customers. I mean, for my job, I work in a charity and I, I work with a lot of mature people and what a lot of they then come to me with is issues around pension or poverty and then being able to pay the costs of their utility bills. So I personally don't think that privatisation of the water companies A, has been a success and I think this mantra that privatisation is the panacea for all ills is a frankly outdated and I mean the point that Nikki made saying that 40 years ago she knew about situations where you know family members would be going to a neighbour to make a telephone call we've moved on considerably in terms of our technological advances our relationships within the community so the idea that you know we should just stick with privatisation as a almost like a principle where it can never be broken I think is incorrect I mean They're pumping sewage into the waters instead of putting the capital investments in so that we don't have that situation. So that doesn't smack of a success in my book. So is nationalisation the answer? I definitely think that people on lower incomes would... would benefit hugely if they didn't have to pay for essential services and one of the priorities that came out of the women's assembly for cop was that essential services like water and electricity those things should be free for people or at least at a considerably reduced rate so half of their income globally doesn't go on those things so if you're saying to me should we nationalize yeah we should ben well, what i think so fascinating about this debate and the wider debate about um Uh, becoming greener uh, is this the gap between the government's rhetoric and some of the government's policy. Boris Johnson's been very public and has got a lot of praise for setting very ambitious climate change goals, becoming net zero on carbon emissions by 2050. It's much trickier when you ask the government, okay, spell out exactly how much that's going to cost and where the cost is going to lie. And on this one, yes, clearly the government, nobody backs raw search going into uh, the environment when they're pressed on why they didn't back this initial amendment, which said, ban it, they said, well, it would cost businesses hundreds of billions of pounds because it's essentially a Victorian piping system and to rip the whole thing up and start again. So I think where the compromise which is emerging tonight is, is there's going to be some kind of duty on those water companies to keep on reducing the amount of sewage going in. But that's another of those tensions that you're going to see play out yeah. the whole of the next month between what they're saying publicly and the ambition and actually when you get to the financial cost, how are you going to achieve that? Denise, have I got an offer for you? 
What's that? Just got an email from the Conservative Party. Ian, win a signed copy of tomorrow's budget. <laughs> enter the prize draw. You can win as many copies as you like, or you can enter as many times as you like, with entries just £5 each. I can't wait. <laughs> With bated breath, in fact. Oh, political fundraising. That's like a David. deficit reduction. <laughs> <laughs> Very bizarre. Um, right, Ben, thank you very much indeed for your question. We'll move on to a very interesting subject next, but you'll have to wait a couple of minutes. It's 8.31. News headlines with Lucinda Horsley. The Queen's pulled out of attending the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow next week and will make a video address instead. Buckingham Palace says she's taken the decision regretfully just days after being told to rest by her doctors. The head of the UN says a report which warns the planet's still on course for a climate catastrophe is a thundering wake-up call. The study says even if current promises are kept, global warming will cause endless suffering. The funeral of murdered MP Sir David Amos will be held at Westminster Cathedral next month. The service is taking place on Tuesday, the 23rd of November. LBC weather outbreaks of heavy rain moving southwards across Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England overnight. Drier in the south and east, a low of 14 degrees. This is LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 
8.35 on LBC. Let me reintroduce my panel to you. David Laws, former Liberal Democrat Cabinet Minister, Denise Headley. Uh, I would say our very own Denise Headley. How would you like me to describe you, Denise? Is that Just all right? Just like that. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, Nikki Aiken is also our very own Nikki Aiken, but she, uh, given that she's basically run the place that we are sitting sitting in at the moment, the former leader of Westminster City Council, now Conservative MP for all the cities of London and Westminster, and Ben Riley Smith, who is political editor of the Telegraph. Well, let's go to the next question. It's from Chris in Croydon. Chris, hi, fire away. Oh, good evening, you. Good evening, panel. Yes, um, my question is this: Is twenty five k to make one street? name woke compliant money well spent um, what is the street name well a, a, any street name that might offend woke people or with associations with slavery for example or political incorrectness or anything you like well, how, how do you know it costs 25,000 pounds to change a street name well that's that was question quoting from the daily telegraph when you think it about must the be true then sorry ah. <laughs> It must be true, all the ramifications here, and all the maps have got to be changed, all the people's um, addresses have got to be changed, and so on, like that. It does, it does mount up, doesn't it? But, but you haven't got any examples of street names that councils are trying to change because of wokeness? Well, uh, yes, well, I think, think there have been one. Well, it was um, um, Black Boy Road has been changed, hasn't it? Uh, and um, so well. on. That, that's an interesting one because in the in the town that I live near in Norfolk, there's a Black Boys pub, and I, I am waiting for the for that there to be a petition for that to be changed. Right, um, Nikki, you know, must know a bit about this. Give, did you ever have to change street names as leader of Westminster City Council? And if so, how much did it cost? No, I didn't. Uh, we created some new names for streets, as in because we had. Uh, I think we changed. Um, uh, part of Regent Street into uh, Lower Regent Street, uh, but no one lived there, so that was all right because no one can afford to live there. Um, but uh, no, and I, I, I don't. I think it's. I hadn't even thought about people's addresses and, and what Chris is suggesting. Um, I don't think it would physically cost twenty five thousand pounds to change um, uh, a street name. Um, but uh, no, I, I've never come across. That type of that type of cost. On, on the wider subject, though, do you think it is right for some streets which have names which at the time wouldn't have been offensive, but now would be? Do you do you think councils should be doing that? Well, I think it's a balance, but I think a road like Black Boy Road, and we're not very far from it from here in Kennington, that I can see why that would be offensive, and I think that I would have I would have no issue if the people living in the area. And I think we have to ask the people who live there how they feel about it. And if there was a, a majority who felt that it wasn't appropriate anymore, then I think there should be... I, I would have no problem with it wanting to be changed. Uh, I think... But there is a balance about remembering our history and our past and accepting it and explaining it. You know, in, in the City of London, which I also represent, in the Guildhall there were two statues that were believed should be brought brought down but I believe the corporation are not doing it because of the cost it's going to cost an absolute fortune and their view was to keep them up there but to explain what these two mm. gentlemen and they were obviously gentlemen uh, did they were obviously there was probably good and bad in their in their work uh, but I think it's about us understanding and appreciating our past to accept our, okay. our, our present and then be able to you know move forward Ben Riley Smith. Well, as a humble reporter, I'm going to tread a little carefully, and we're not meant to be revealing our own personal views. But I, I will share this for uh, anecdote. When I was in Glasgow for the Glasgow Herald, uh, fantastic newspaper, and uh, you've come a long way, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I was only there for six months, but it was brilliant. Um, I had a great time, and, and during the period then, I can't remember which archive, but um, an archive down in London dropped a full list of all the slave owners who were paid reparations when slavery was abolished and allowed us as reporters to take each of those names, track it down. And there were, we realised there were artworks up in some of the Glasgow museums that hadn't referenced this history. And so we wrote stories saying, shouldn't there be a plaque saying it? And I remember one of the spokesmen for one of the museums said, do you not realise that almost every single cultural point in Glasgow, huge numbers of the streets' names, will refer to Britain's colonial past? This mm. was the second city of the empire. 
And if you start going down that track, there'll be so many other things you can point at. And I think he said even in our newspaper's history, shouldn't we, shouldn't we look at that, the Glasgow Herald at the time? So that just gives you a sense of the scale of the challenges and it is unbelievably difficult to work out where you draw the line between what is deemed offensive now and what is just a big part of our cultural heritage. Denise, we've talked about these issues a lot on LBC over the last year or so. Um, what's your view on this? I think the question in itself is not um, a correct question because the suggestion of woke compliance, I don't even know what that actually means and um, presumably the caller might wish to elaborate because I'm not familiar with that terminology and what it actually means. No, but you know what he means. Yeah, I know what it means, but it doesn't mean I have to, you know, garner my response around that position and I don't accept the position of woke compliance in the first place. I think the issue that is we are having in the UK and in other parts of the world is that the question of inherent systemic inequality and and the benefits that have been derived in the developed world as a consequence of that are a difficult, like Ben said, huge scale debate to have, not just a debate, but to address the questions. Changing road names and working on personal interreactions is one way to address systemic inequality. But what you also have to do is look at the systems that they built and the beneficiaries and the benefits from it. And I actually think those beneficiaries are linked to our, our climate failures because we have the same type of systems that are based on extraction from the developing world and expansion. And what that actually means is that we are always going to be in this position unless we have something significantly done. And, you know, you can change a street name, but that's not actually going to make a huge amount of difference to systemic inequality in that street. So that's my position. Um, Paul has texted, Black Boy Lane in South Tottenham is estimated to cost £150,000 to change the name by Haringey Council. Nick Ferrari dealt with this issue some days ago. Don't be so condescending to your listeners. Well, I don't think I have been, but there we go. D uh, David? Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds a very expensive sign and a very expensive process for changing it. But but my, my main um, point would be around the amount of time that we seem to be absorbing in this country at the moment on the woke versus anti-woke debate. We seem to have groups of people on either extremes who are very passionate about this, either about some fairly, it seems to me, niche woke issues and people who are very stirred up by the woke side of it and spend all their time criticising that. We have much bigger challenges in our country today that relate to the inequalities that are here now, not some of the problems that we can't really change from 100 years or 200 years or 300 years ago. We've talked about education recovery today. We've talked about inequality and the cut in universal credit. I think as a nation, we need to be much more focused on these real policy issues affecting the opportunities of people who are here today rather than this sort of culture war process trying to revisit what's happened over the last 500 years and i'm one of the people who find this whole debate about wokishness extremely depressing and not relevant to the things that i'm interested in denise I just don't understand why everyone likes to utilise the term woke, because what it does is it diminishes the debate. We're talking about structural inequality. OK, over the road from where we are is the Palace of Westminster. And you've got how many other stately buildings which were built on generational theft. So it's not a matter of saying, can we just look at today? We have to look at how those systems and how those situations are impacting on people today. So if we're going to address inequality, we need to also look at the roots of inequality. And it's easy to say, well, I'm sorry, you know, let's just move on to something else, because frankly, it's not an issue for me this afternoon. But it's an issue for people going forward for the next three or four generations. Why do you think we have some of the situations we have now? Not I think the, the amount be, of time you know, that we could spend debating all of the injustices which have undoubtedly occurred over the it's last thousand about years a debate. We is want wasted action. if we're not discussing the real problems that we've got now and fixing those. And how do you think those problems came about what problems the problems of inequality and structural inequality do you think it just developed a week ago i don't think it came developed a week ago but i think that we now have potentially in our hands some of the policy levers that could address those issues now and i think that is where the debate should be Such not as? sort of well you've you've mentioned one yourself uh, a moment ago about universal credit i mentioned the issue of education recovery two areas where i think government is not doing enough and i think the debates that we could be having around those issues which relate directly to equality in our society today are much more interesting to me than unravelling the injustices of the past and trying to reflect that in society today. OK, spirited debate there. Chris, thank you very much indeed for that question. We'll come to more of your calls in just a moment. It's 8.45. 
LBC. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. You know, there's something very strange about some of these anti-vaxxers. If you take something such as smallpox or others, that has been eradicated in this country because of vaccinations. If you look at last week, four out of five people in hospital suffering from COVID had not had their vaccinations. The case for vaccination is an incredibly compelling one. So if you want to have your Facebook protest, do it, but don't do it at the school gates. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 10 to 9. Um, I'm looking at my text feed here. One person says Denise for Chancellor. The next says Denise for PM. The next says not Denise for Queen. But says <laughs> Ian, uh, the star once again is Denise. Love the way she expresses and makes her point. No side to her. And she clearly thinks of others with no thought to herself. That's from Cindy. Oh. 
Uh, she won't be able to get out of that door soon. Her head will be so big. Say moi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, let's go on to another question. It's a text question from Samantha in Barnsley. Uh, they are saying tonight that the House of Commons is making face masks mandatory for everyone except MPs. Why is it always one rule for them and one rule for the rest of us? Now, I think you've got some latest information on this, Ben. I do. We were looking at this just before we came on air. I think with a lot of these discussions, it's all due to the unbelievably complicated nature of Parliament, parliamentary rules, who they have oversight with, who they don't. Essentially, under the parliamentary authorities, all the staff... Um, and actually I believe the reporters um, coming in to report on things have to abide by those rules but there is this strange traditional setup that David and Nicky probably know much more about than me that the 650 MPs are essentially independent offices separate from the parliamentary authorities so parliament cannot tell MPs to wear masks whereas they can tell all the staff to wear masks but clearly to listeners and people out in the wider world it, it does look like double standards What about Lords? It's a good question. Oh, I would imagine caught you out was, there, didn't I? Well, I'd imagine the MPs have this funny uh, power because they are democratically elected and voices of the people, whereas lords are obviously sit for life and aren't democratically elected. So I'm, I'm going to guess and say lords probably aren't in quite the same way, uh, the, the picture that MPs are. I was in the lords on Tuesday and virtually all of them were wearing face masks, but they all are, well, most of them are quite elderly, aren't they? Yes, a lot of grey hair in the lords. Um, Nikki, do you think you should be exempt from this rule? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we should be exempt. I think it's up to us to make uh, our own decisions. I personally have begun wearing a mask because infection rates in Westminster have increased and there are people I know who work for me and uh, close family family members who have had COVID recently and I just think it's a responsible thing to do to wear a mask, particularly if you are in a, in a crowded area like, uh, like, like tomorrow in the budget, it will be full, so I will wear a mask. David? I think it would be totally wrong to have a situation where MPs or a lot of MPs were not wearing masks, but they were expecting the parliamentary staff to do so. After all, the point of masks is largely to protect other people, not just to pr protect yourself. So I think to expose the parliamentary staff potentially to the risk of COVID, when after all, many MPs are very active in their constituencies, they've been meeting lots of people, there is a risk that they're spreaders. And I, I think in addition to that, the example that MPs or some MPs are setting by not wearing masks in the House of Commons chamber is deeply unhelpful. And it's perhaps one of the reasons why when many of us go on public transport these days, expecting to see the vast majority of people wearing masks, actually quite often find that 60, 70, 80 percent of people are not bothering to do so. So I think that it's not just a, a courtesy to House of Commons staff, but an example to the country and a very low cost, low inconvenience way of restricting the circulation of COVID. Uh, right, let's go on to a final question from Andrew in Edgware. It says on my screen here, Andrew, you're 17 years old. Uh, what's your question, please? Hi, um, I wanted to ask a question about what you would do um, about the current GCSE and A-level crisis that's going on. Um, personally, as a student, I'm finding it very stressful as the government hasn't actually told us whether our mocks are going to actually be our GCSEs or not. And I can tell even from the whole class and anyone who's doing exams, really, it's a very stressful time at the moment because we're being pressured to be working our very, very best so that we do the best in our mocks. But at the same time, we're also going to have the GCSEs and A-levels. They might be later. So I think it's really important that we have clarity what's going to be happening because it's just been so stressful for all students. Well, we're hoping to do an hour-long phone-in with the Education Secretary, Nadim Zahawi, in the next few weeks. So um, we're going to make a note of your number, Andrew, and so you can put that question directly to him. But in the meantime, let's put it to former Schools Minister David Laws. Yeah, it has been incredibly stressful for young people over this period of the pandemic, and there have been lots of uncertainties about GCSEs and A-levels. And I think that part of that is the uncertainties around the pandemic that are inevitable. But I also think that the Department for Education has been pretty flat-footed at times in getting information about the exam system and other issues out to schools and out to students. And I think that they could do a better job in giving more early advice. I think we do know that the government 
is very set on having the usual examinations next year in GCSEs and A-levels where people go into an exam hall and take those tests. But many students are still having to wait until early next year before they find out what subject content is actually going to be examined. And I think the more we can strip away uncertainty for teachers and students at what is a very stressful time and give them decent notice, the better. And I hope that the new education secretary can do a better job on that than his predecessor, who I, I don't think did help students and teachers on this in many ways. Ben? Well, I'd be interested to hear from David, actually, but there's this issue, which is grade inflation, which has played out over the summer. If we're going to return to that new system of exams, would you want to see grades drop back down? Because that's what's so challenging, I imagine, for Andrew and some of his peers, maybe in the couple of years ahead, is they've done so well, but then the people coming through behind them might have to do less well proportionally just to revert back to that old system. So how would you get around that? Yeah, I mean, we've had, as, as you said, a hell of a lot of grade inflation over the last couple of years. And I think that has created a variety of problems in the system. We need to go back to the sort of uh, grade distribution that we had prior to the crisis. I don't think we can go there overnight. If we did, then you'd have students in um, next door year groups being graded in a very different way. So the, the approach that the government's now announced with the exams regulator, where we will go back to the 2019 grading, but we'll go there over a period of a couple of years, I think is probably the most sensible approach. Denise? I think it's difficult for students. It's the most stressful time for a young person preparing for exams and not having clarity about what's going to happen and how it's going to happen must be deeply disturbing. I think with the last uh, education st um, secretary, he was basically not very good and we're hoping to see what happens with uh, Mr Zahawi maybe he will be much more focused on ensuring that young people's you know needs for clarity via their schools is addressed in a much more focused way than his predecessor Nikki I've got a 15 year old son doing GCSEs next summer and a daughter doing A levels next summer so believe me Andrew I absolutely understand where you're coming from and I can promise you I am talking to the education secretary and the schools minister all the time to ensure that students and teachers get the clarification they need as soon as they can. But at the moment, the plan is for uh, the exams to, co to continue in the summer. And I wish you all the very best of luck because I know it's been a tough couple of years. Yeah. Andrew, back to you quickly. And even to add on to that, I've got my mocks all coming up. So I've got my nine GCSEs, which I'm taking. Um, that's going to be in a month's time. And I still haven't been told what topics are coming up, what topics aren't coming up. And the general idea which I'm getting at is that our GCSEs or, and the people's A-levels are not going to be changed. When in theory, I really honestly think our year has actually lost out the most. We've gone through two lockdowns over school, learning all of the, the terminology and everything that we've been learning. And I think that's been emphasised that our year really has been not affected because they think that we haven't gone through the year 11 part of it, only the year 9 and 10, when really in theory that's actually the time when we're learning all of the main important things. Well, Andrew, thank you very much for phoning in and, and good luck with those mocks and indeed the real exams when they take place. Uh, final text question from Marie in Waterloo. The Kebab Awards are on tonight, so it's the perfect time for me to ask your panel what is their go-to order at their local kebab shop? David Laws. I'm afraid I haven't had a kebab since I was at university, uh, which was quite a few years ago. So my only recommendation is whatever you have, take a large amount of beer with it afterwards. That always, <laughs> I think, helped me a little bit. Nikki? I tend to go for a lamb, sheesh, but without any bread. Go lots, lots of salad and lots of hummus. Denise? I tend to go for a shish if I do have one, because that elephant leg... That's left there. You together. Yeah, that elephant leg that's <laughs> rotating on a stick's not very appetising. No, no, see, that's what... I've never had a kebab in my life. <laughs> ben? Well, I'm going to reveal myself to be a hypocrite, because at the start of the show I said I was eating less meat. Actually, on Friday I had a kebab, oh. and it was a donna wrap, which is my preference. Well, I'm so glad we had that question, Marie. Thank you very much indeed for that. We've certainly covered a lot of issues on the show tonight, haven't we? Uh, don't forget, if you miss any of tonight's show or if you missed any of the previous episodes, you can catch up on the Cross Question podcast, download it wherever you get your podcasts from, or you can watch previous episodes on Global Player or the LBC YouTube channel. Coming up in a moment, we are going to ask you, what do you think the Chancellor should announce tomorrow on public sector pay? Particularly want to hear from you if you are a public sector worker, maybe you haven't had 
a pay rise for 10, 11, 12, may, maybe more years. What are you expecting from the Chancellor? Or do you think, in any case, it's all going to be eaten up by tax rises and inflation? 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, the Queen will no longer host a major reception for world leaders at the COP26 Climate Change Summit in Glasgow. Buckingham Palace says she's been told by doctors to rest after an overnight stay in hospital last Wednesday. Her Majesty